After puberty, we are basically doomed. Our next keynote speaker is a neuroscientist. She's internationally recognized for her research on, a, on early language and brain development and studies that show how young children learn. Her work has played a major role in demonstrating how early exposure to language alter, alters the brain. She is Bezos Family Foundation Endowed Chair, co-director of the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington, and an expert in bilingual brain development. Please, let's welcome Dr. Patricia Kuhl. Patricia, welcome. Hello, Elena. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am a neuroscientist, very, very interested in how humans learn, particularly children, uh, from infancy to adolescence. Modern neuroscience now lets us look inside the human brain as a child or an adult learns. And what we are learning from those studies is going to revolutionize education in the next decade. Language is a great example. 21st century children should be learning a second language. Maybe they should be learning multiple languages. And so there are many, many benefits to learning second languages, to being multilingual. But when is the best time to learn a second language? Well, this slide shows you what the neuroscience studies is, is telling us. The infants and young children are geniuses to the age of seven. And then every two years after the age of seven, it becomes more difficult. After puberty, it becomes very, very difficult. It doesn't mean that you can't learn. It takes longer. It's much more difficult. You don't use the same brain machinery that you used when you were a young child. We can now see this in the brain. Essentially, there's a trade-off between that open mind and that you know, ready-to-learn baby brain and the brains of puberty and beyond uh, people who are dedicated and um, experts at particular things. So what happens in early uh, development is that you're ready to map the information that you experience. And the growth of networks in the brain are experience-driven. Once those networks are formed, it becomes much harder to learn. And as adults, we have the beauty of expertise, but not the openness that we had as young children. Uh, a utopia of learning would be if we could combine the expertise of adulthood with the open mind of the child. And that's a problem that philosophers discuss all the time. So what is it that makes the babies so good? Part of it has to do with their growing brains. If you look at this slide, which shows the size of the human brain from birth to adulthood, you see that by age five, the brain is 92% of its total size. It's growing in that first five years more rapidly than it will ever grow again. What's making that brain so big? It's the growing of connections. If you look at the left panel, at birth there are 86 billion neurons in the baby brain, but they're not connected to one another. And so by age three, the connections are rampant at a million a second, a million a second, the neurons are growing connections so that they can, like telephone wires, so they can talk to one another. And then a massive pruning takes place because by puberty, we are using only the synapses that we have used in our early development. And so the ones that are not necessary are pruned. Pruning produces that expertise. You focus, that brain focuses on the networks that have been developed. So again, we get this trade-off. Early in development, that system is ready to learn anything. A three-year-old can learn anything. By the time you're an adult, you have 86 trillion synapses, but they're dedicated, dedicated to the things that you have learned. Another way that we can look at the brain in, with our modern technology is to look at the long-range connections that are growing in the brain based on experience. What we see here is one child at seven months, at 11 months, and at 26 months. And we're measuring myelin in the brain. Myelin is the substance that covers the neurons so that the information can speed rapidly from one place in the brain to another. So you see the seven-monther has already some 
myelin growth, but it's not yet yellow. Yellow is the fastest, the most myelin. And at 11 months, it's growing, but by 26 months. So the next time you look at a two-year-old and you talk to a two-year-old, just think about the network that's going on in that child's brain. It's extraordinary. So all this brain science is telling us that human learning in that early period is, is marvelous. So how is the baby brain using this brain, her brain, his brain, to learn a language? We did tests over the past 20 years in many countries. I had laboratories set up in eight or nine different countries, in Asia, in Russia, in most of Europe, in South America. And we were asking questions about how the infants are learning and when they're learning. We used tests on babies' abilities to hear the distinctions between sounds. They have to hear the sounds that represent consonants and vowels in order to distinguish words. They can't learn words until they, we can know that they discriminate the sounds. So I'm describing in the next movie uh, the way we test infants. You'll see a little six-monther sitting on mom's lap and listening to a sound, ah, ah. The babies learn that when the sound changes from ah to anything else, the baby has three seconds to turn their head to see a dancing toy in a box. Here's what it looks like. Can a baby as young as six months old hear the difference between two vowels? This baby is trained to look for the toy when the sound changes. She's being distracted, so she'll turn only when she hears the difference in sounds. The key question, will she turn before the toy lights up? That baby is a genius, and she knows it. So when we did these tests all over the world with the sounds of all languages, what we discovered is that babies at six months of age are citizens of the world, meaning they can discriminate the sounds used in all of the words in all of the languages in the world. It's amazing because the parents sitting behind those children can't do that. The parents sitting behind the children are language bound. They can hear the distinctions only for the languages they were exposed to in the first seven years. So when do these little citizens of the world change into adults who are language bound before their first birthdays? This is the result in one country. We were in Tokyo where the little babies are learning Japanese and in America, in Seattle, where they're learning English. And we're using a contrast, ra, 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 changing to la, that is important to English but not to Japanese. And what we saw is that at six months of age, all the babies in both countries do perfectly well, well above chance, about 65%. They turn their heads at the right time when the sound changes. But two months later, something amazing happens. The babies listening to their native sounds, the Americans, are getting better. The Japanese babies are getting much worse. And all of them are preparing to learn words. They're doing exactly what they have to do in order to learn the words of the language. When we tested in Beijing with Mandarin sounds, the Chinese learning babies are zooming up and the American baby is going down. When we tested in Spain and when we tested in France, wherever you test, this same phenomenon is going on. Between eight months and 10 months, the baby brain is changing uh, to master the sounds that they're hearing us speak and giving a loss of their ability to hear the distinctions of foreign languages. This is that pruning process going on. The equipotentiality that they had early in development is now, uh, is now leaving. So we see that there's a sensitive period in development. During this two-month period, something's happening in the baby brain. They're responding to listening to us speak. So I wanted to ask a question. What happens if we expose babies during this sensitive period to a brand new language for the first time? So we tried this with Spanish and we tried this with Mandarin Chinese, and the kids had only 12 sessions each 20 minutes to listen to a play session in which an adult is speaking in that foreign language. And here is what those sessions look like. This is the bottom line of that experiment. The social brain gates human learning. But here's how we discovered that. Jasper, Zhang Hi, we're going to talk 
看看发生了什么事情哦。小小熊七七在这里，一个绿色的圈圈，绿色的圈圈，绿色的圈圈，来转一下，转一圈，嘿，一圈，再一次哦，转一，一，二。Done. Okay, so how is your Mandarin coming along? The babies in this experiment learned so well, they were exactly equal to the kids in Beijing or Taiwan. Five hours of exposure was enough to have them learn the sounds and the words that they'd heard、uh, from this foreign language. We then ran this experiment because the learning was so exciting. We wanted to know, can they learn via a, a video? So we brought in new babies. They had the same exposure in the same room for the same amount of time. And it looked as though they were learning, but our tests, brain and behavior afterwards, show there was no learning whatsoever. The babies in the live exposure learned perfectly. The babies in the TV condition, the video, learned nothing at all. They were equivalent to the control group, who had learned nothing、uh, because they were only exposed to English. It was the control group. What's going on in the brain? Why is this social so important? We have a 2.5 million dollar machine that helps us answer that question. We're the first in the world to put babies in this machine because it's perfectly safe and non-invasive. We can see a movie of the activity in the brain as the baby is learning. So when we expose the baby to a live speaker as opposed to a television set. What we see is there's a network in the brain that connects auditory areas to social areas to the motor areas that the baby uses to talk back. When you speak to a young child, you're activating the circuitry that allows them to speak back. So, when you know all of this about the brain and how how learning occurs for languages, and you believe in bilingualism, what do you do? You buy an airplane ticket and go to Madrid. Why do we go to Madrid? Because Madrid has a genius solution to infant education, and that is the neighborhood schools. In 2015, we were here in four schools with my new bilingual, brain-based program for learning a second language. In 2018-19, we were in 13 schools with 800 children. We're running randomized control experiments where half of the children get the、um, intervention method that was invented based on the research, and the other half get the、uh, Madrid community practice for bilingual learning in these schools. Not as intense,、uh, but the kids are getting some exposure to、uh, nursery rhymes and to book reading and some vocabulary learning. But our intervention is very, very intense for one hour a day. The children are interacting with each other and with the teachers in group activities and games and playful things. The curriculum is very language-based but play-based, both in groups, in small groups, and one-on-one. -on -one. The kids are getting the experience talking. We get them to talk because the brain science shows us that listening to speech activates these motor centers. The data from 2015 were amazing. Standardized tests said that Spanish grew at the same level, but English in the red group at all four ages that we were、uh, working, the children's production of English is five to ten times more than in the control group. These kids are speaking in words, phrases, and sentences、uh, after 18 weeks of exposure. Now, we. Understanding how well this learning occurs and realizing it has to be face-to-face -face learning, we knew we couldn't scale up without going to software. We had, for the 2015 experiment, trained all the tutors in person, but then we created software that does the training for us. It has two to three weeks of intense training. Uh, via software only, not face to face, on the principles of the method and the 32-week curriculum, and I'm here to tell you today that the 2018-2019 data are phenomenal. We replicate with the 32 tutors trained with the sparkling software. We get the same result, and in fact, we're most excited about this graphic because several of the 13 schools we worked in this year. We're the poorest in Madrid's neighborhood. The poorest neighborhoods in the Madrid、uh, system. These children have parents who cannot read. When the parents came in and had to sign the human subject forms, they had to make an X after the directors explained what the experiments are about. So these children are children who had never been read to in their entire lives. Did they learn? Look at the data. They look amazing. 
uh, after 18 weeks of intervention. And I just heard this morning that the 32-week data, the kids who were exposed for 32 weeks, doubled their productions. These are English utterances produced uh, per child per hour. They're really, really talking. So the bottom line is, here's our Madrid graduates, some of our graduates who were celebrated with their brain t-shirts and their mortarboard hats. All children around the entire world can learn a second language and probably multiple languages if they're taught at the right time using the right method. I think we can too as adults. Some of the secrets are there in the baby data. This social exposure, the social immersion, the social brain is the gateway to learning, even in adulthood. I often say to my students, if you're over 30, if you're over 50 and you want to learn a second language, perhaps you should fall in love with someone who speaks that language so that the social brain would be totally engaged. Of course, I have to be careful with that recommendation because my husband's in the audience. We think that there may someday be a software. This is an experimental question. Can there be a software, a, a robot? Can there be something social enough to turn on the social brain in humans, because that's what has to happen for learning to occur. Maybe yes, maybe no. The experiments will show us. But the social brain is the gateway to learning. The babies are showing us how that works, and those principles might allow all of us to learn throughout our entire lives. And perhaps Madrid will lead the way. Thanks very much. Thank you, Patricia. I'm going to ask uh, Patricia to join us uh, on the second chair from the band. I'm going to ask Patricia to stay with us because she's, she's going to join our next uh, panel and the last one of this afternoon, which is uh, la uh, language learning and technology. It's about language learning. And I'm going to take over from what you said, Patricia, and I'm glad you mentioned it, because I can remember when there were only two ways to learn a language. One to pour over textbooks and bulky dictionaries in trying to memorize, as Dr. Uh, pa um, Barbara Oakley was um, telling us uh, sometimes how useful, uh, useless it is. And the other one is to marry a foreigner, <laughs> right? And I did the latter. I married an Englishman who's also in the audience to end up teaching him Spanish, hence my appalling English. Sorry for that. After all, as the Turkey, Turkish proverb goes, dil dile dehmeden dil ogrenilmes. Are there any Turkish speakers in the audience? Any Turkish speakers? One. Oh my God. My pronunciation was worse than my English, so I'm going to try to translate and you tell me if it's right. A language cannot be learned without touching tongues. Yes? Yes! Thumbs up! Well, you know, I spoke uh, Japanese yesterday, Turkish today, who knows tomorrow. Today, learning a language, a foreign language, has never been easier. Technology has revolu revolutionized the whole process. Although, I think you can still mar marry a foreigner, but just do it for love. To tell us more, we have a, prepared a fantastic panel, the last panel for this afternoon. And to moderate it, we have with us Ricardo Mesquita. He's the head of immersive learning at IE Exponential Learning. He's an entrepreneur, mentor, and advisor for early stage startups and passionate about education and technology. His panel is formed by Bernard Niesner, CEO of uh, Busu, Christ Cristobal Biedma, CEO of Lingo Kids and Richard Vaughn, he's the founder and chairman of Vaughn Systems. Let's welcome them all. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> welcome. Love the talk. Love it's been beautiful. All right, everyone. Thank you for staying with us. We're the last panel on the afternoon. I, um, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, having a glass of wine with uh, Patricia the other day, and, uh, and there was a... Uh, impressive uh, conversation is so l learning a l another a second language is um, is a labor of love uh, and it's good for you it's uh, it's cognitively speaking especially not only at an early early age right so we have a, a wonderful panel with us uh, and I just wanted to throw out there how are we with uh, learning as a, a language today is that you know mixing more traditional uh, uh, education, but also with technology, where do we stand today? Uh, are people looking for it? Is it a personal endeavor? Is it a professional search? Anyone? Well, it depends on the age. And the age <laughs> uh, for, for, 
for um, Pat, well, of course, she starts with people at age seven months or even before, perhaps. I usually start with people who are 35 years old who say, please, endow me with the English language cheaply and quickly. <laughs> it, it's like, may, may the English language descend upon you and remain with you. Amen. <laughs> and it doesn't work that way. So for adults, the approach, of course, is approach that requires bringing out the motivation in the student because it's hard work. It's, pain, it's not painless. And so my approach is going through the heart and getting the student to fall in love with English if possible. And to do that, the, he has to fall in love with me first. <laughs> if he falls in love with the teacher, if the teacher's cool, the subject is cool. Even if it's algebra or Lope de Vega or Shakespeare. And so that's my job, much different than little children. But adults need to learn second languages as well. <laughs> How many, uh, I mean, I know, I know uh, Bernard for, for quite some time now, and I know the, the evolution of Buzua, and I was impressed. We were looking at it last night. I mean, I, I remember the original versions, and, and it has gone a long way, a long time ago. Yeah. So tell me, what, what are people looking into? Because you're, you're, it's mobile first. People are looking into your app. So what are the interests? What triggers their, their interest in a second language and how do they progress? Yeah, so we as Busa, we have now around 100 million users from over 190 different countries. And the interests and reasons why people learn a language really differ also per country and per age group. Yeah. Um, the thing is that, especially in emerging markets, learning a language is not a hobby, it's the route to success. Because especially to learn English, uh, you know, it helps you to just improve your career. But in other markets, um, we see a lot of our users learning because they uh, improve their studies. Um, they are young professionals to, so again, improve their careers. And then once they become like 40 or 50, then it's really more about, I think, travel reasons, culture, etc. So, you know, there are several different reasons to learn a language, but we try to help all of them. Right. And, and Chris is the founder and CEO of, of Lingo Kids, and uh, you, your age group is between two and eight? Between two to eight years old. Yeah. Right. So th the parents' supervision or presence is also there somehow. How do you, how do you engage children in, in learning at that, at that stage? Uh, I mean, it has to be a very playful experience, right? So uh, children, if you go to kindergarten, and I'm sure Kat has seen this a lot of times, it's all about play, um, so it has to be something fun. Uh, I suppose so, some parents think there has to be some kind of like, uh, you know, like drilling, you know, like vocabulary and so on. And to us, it's more like exposure and like letting the child drive the experience. So we create um, between uh, games, interactive content, songs, audiobooks, a variety of formats, and we drive, we let the child drive the experience. On top of that, we try to engage parents. Um, we actually kind of like rename the phrase of like screen time. A lot of people is afraid of a screen time, of course, especially with children. Um, the way we take about it is like, it has to be more like a, a bonding experience. Right? It's a, a good time for the parents to get with the children, the same way that you are engaging sometimes with your couple when watching a movie, right? Um, so we also provide content for parents and try to like involve them in a non judgmental way, try not welcome families to be part of the journey of, the amazing journey of learning for kids. Right. Pat, I was looking at your uh, presentation also. How do you manage technology in the learning of a second language? Because do you give at early age lots of exposure? Should you, you know, measure? How do you play that? Well, I think technology has this role to play. So we could see in the experiments that babies were not learning from a flat TV screen, not interactive. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have many experiments underway right now yeah. looking at uh, more interactive technologies. Uh, we see that learning increases when you allow the baby to touch the screen, for example. And learning increases even more if two babies are learning together. If one baby learns alone by touching the screen, the brain responses nudge up a little bit. But when you put a second baby alongside the first baby, mm -hmm. it's not as though they're teaching each other. It's the excitement of having a second baby present. And in fact, the more novel the new baby, the more they learn. So this gets back to the social brain and the excitatory nature of learning. We learn best when we're excited, when we're motivated, when we we feel like we can't stop. We just want to do right. that. That's what I to do. That, exactly. That's what so, I try to do with adults as well. What I try to do with adults, exactly. just like the two little children, yes. <laughs> the, the social, the emotional right. aspect of learning. If you can touch on the emotional fiber, 
you've got you're, it. You're halfway there. I, th I think that's true. And so we leave it to the tech d gurus, the geniuses in the technology world, to, to tell us where the technology can go. Where can it go? Uh, I think we're curious. Uh, not that I want to substitute um, technologies, uh, you know, a, a very social robot for a person, because I think that young children need to be bathed in human interaction. This is how the brain gets wired. This is how the brain turns on. But if kids were learning in a social setting and then had additional practice through engaging technology, that could be the sweet spot uh, for learning. So collaboration, yes. even at that young age, peer-to-peer yes. uh, -peer, uh, makes, makes a difference because they, it's playful, right? It's playful. Uh, 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 Bernard, I mean, Chris, are you embedding this in your... In your such as uh, proven that because social is at heart uh, of Busu. So right. we define ourselves as a social network for language learning. So you don't only learn with the courses with, that we develop, but you also learn from other native speakers. So you send off exercises, and then you get a correction from a native speaker on your exercises. And the same way also you can help someone else to learn your own native language. And actually, we discovered that if people are engaging in our social community features, they're five times more likely to actually finish the course than if they just learn by themselves. And I think there's an element of uh, teaching others and stepping out um, from the student role into right. the tutor role. Yes. Because with language learning, it's all about making mistakes. You need to make mistakes in order to progress. And if you see other people making mistakes in your own native language, and you can actually help them, you gain a bit more confidence, and you gain more motivation, and then you proceed also in your own learning progress. In our case, we, we've seen something similar, right? Like when parents are also engaged in the education of the children, we double retention rates and engagement between the children as well. Uh, some parents only like let the children write the experience by themselves, and uh, that's not as engaging. Um, so yeah. I, I'm 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 curious, Richard. You know, when I knew that you were going to join us, and you've been you're American, uh, but you've been in Spain for more than 40 years. How do you see the evolution of learning, and mainly focusing in, in English? How do you see the evolution of English uh, learning in 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 Spain? Uh, how, it's, in your it's, much, it's a lot better now than 20 years ago. I would say I've been here since 1974 permanently, and up to perhaps the year 2000, I didn't see very much progress in, in the school system. However, the, one, the government of the community of Madrid started what is called bilingual schools, colegios bilingües, in the Escuela Pública and the Concertada. But in, and even though I didn't agree, and I still don't agree exactly with how they do it, it's so much better than what was before, that yes, now when young people finish secondary school, finish the, bac the baccalaureate at age 18, they're not afraid of English. They, they, are, they, they take it like a, just a friend. English is a friend. Even though they still make mistakes, they still don't understand 100%. They're so much better than before. Then I have to support uh, the effort that has been made by the governments here with, with language. Although I would do it a different way. I think I could do it better, but they've done it very well. <laughs> they've done it well. <laughs> And there's a lot of content that in the past was all dubbed, and now you get an original version subtitled, so you get a lot of um, much more um, uh, access to, to the, especially to the English language, no? See one thing. We're, this is a, the, this group, we're, here we're talking about technology in business and in education. However, I think most of the achievements uh, that we see in the public school and private school systems here for English have been through what they call conversational assistants, people who came from different, from the US, Canada, the UK, Ireland, and they spent up to 10 hours a week talking at the children, more than talking to. And just that exposure, which is low tech, <laughs> human tech, uh, has been very, very important in the achievement of these goals. I, I would also say there's a bit of a shift in attitudes in, in Spain towards uh, foreign languages. When I came to Spain in uh, 2007, it was like, estamos en España, hay que hablar español, no? And uh, I think nowadays it's, it's actually quite different. Uh, also, to a certain extent, I think with the financial crisis that hit Spain really hard, people understood that they also cannot just rely on the Spanish market, that they had to be much more international, that they had to go uh, and export abroad. And I think nowadays you hear much more English in Madrid and in other cities in Spain. Um, there's only one thing I still don't understand, that it's in, in, in Spain kind of common to pronounce English words the Spanish way. Like even the taxi driver this morning was saying, uh, was that a SUS summit? 
No? So uh, to say some summit, uh, it's still, uh, you need a bit of, to overcome uh, this hurdle to pronounce it properly. All right. Well, the younger, the younger generation doesn't suffer very much in Spain. What is called in Spanish the sense of the ridiculous, feeling like a fool exactly. when you speak a second language. Yeah, exactly. The younger generation, the post-millennials especially, don't suffer this very much, or as much less than before. I think that worldwide, the benefits of bilingualism, and it's not just English, it's any two language, languages or, la or multiple languages. The benefits are economic. The jobs are there more frequently for people who speak multiple languages. The social exposure to more people and more cultures. The cognitive benefits, not that you become smarter, but the research has shown from the earliest ages, at 11 months up to adulthood, you can show that people who are bilingual are more cognitively flexible meaning that if you give them a new problem that they've never had before, they are quicker to invent a solution to that problem. Whereas monolinguals tend to go back to the old way they did it, and even if it's not successful, they persist. So there's a cognitive flexibility produced by the brain's learning of multiple languages. And then the last one is the health benefits. You will not cognitively age as rapidly if you're bilingual or multilingual. You will not have Alzheimer's as frequently if you're bilingual or multilingual. So I think people around the world, although America is going to be last at this, the US has still not got the, got the idea, that bilingualism is the way of the future. It's most of the world speaks one or more, two or more languages, and there are these benefits, so why not? And I feel like it's, Spanish is becoming a much more spoken yes. language in the U.S. than it was uh, in, in the Absolutely. past, right? Uh, so we should never stop learning. Um, so I, I myself, I speak four languages. I picked English at a young age, so I was exposed uh, it's not my native language, but I was able to pick a couple of, you know, I speak Spanish fairly enough, uh, and I picked it later in life. So my question, and most of the audience is uh, older, so how do you, at what point in, can you, can you expect to actually pick up a new language at any given point in time? What is the, what do you say, how can you uh, uh, approach that? I think the science says that you can learn at any age. It's just how difficult is it going to be? How many hours will you have to spend? And how, what's your expertise level going to be? We've been doing some studies with college-age students at the University of Washington who come in from China. They're between 19 and 25, so they're young adults. And they immediately go into social immersion for English so that they can handle their classes. So we started studying them brain imaging them every single day that they're in the social English exposure. We can actually see the growth of white matter tracts in the brain. Every day, those white matter tracts get stronger over the five weeks of the immersion program. However, if you start keep imaging as the program ends, and then every day that they're not in exposure, the white matter tracts get weaker again. Right? They're not babies, right? If you're a baby, that exposure lasts. If you're an adult, you really have to keep at it or it will start to shrink back. I remember, I have a, a, a case. About three years ago, I was in Manhattan on vacation, and I stopped at one of the corners where the, a man was selling hot dogs. And he, was, he had a, an accent that sounded Mediterranean. And I said, well, you speak English well. He said, I, said, I would like a hot dog. Where are you from? He said, I am from Greece. <laughs> Very good, but your English is not bad. Bah, how did you learn English? Selling hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and only in eight months, he had been in Manhattan for only eight months, coming from Greece. But because he needed English to sell hot dogs, yeah. <laughs> it's so, motivation. And motivation can become from emotion or from need. Yeah. And see. So it's interesting. So yeah, and also the goal he was having probably, he was not con so concerned about like, making the perfect English, a grammatical perfect, like just communication. He just wanted to talk and get understood. Well, yes. language and that's is something sometimes we get very lost about. Yes, yes, yes. Languages um, exist as vehicles for other, other purposes. Only the poets study language for language's sake. Mm -hmm. So it's a vehicle for other objectives. And the Spaniards. So, yeah. The Spaniards as well. We do. Because <laughs> I, I, know, I know many people who are successful in their job abroad with broken English. And so it's, you don't need, you, if you go to the United Nations or to Brussels, you'll hear all kinds of accents and all kinds of mistakes, but they are successfully performing their functions mm -hmm. as well as me in my own language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So we, we have um, now over 4 billion data points from our users of uh, where we can study and improve our systems of how to most effectively learn a language. And there's a few things we have identified. Number one, don't cram in language learning. So don't learn just one time a week for several hours, because you will not succeed. It's much more effective if you learn three times a week for 10 to 15 minutes every time you learn. Those users are much more successful. Number two, make mistakes. A lot of mistakes go out there. Don't be afraid. We see those users who dare, who expose themselves. They will progress much further. And then number three, also socially engage. Interact with other users, or at best, if you can afford to, travel in the country, fully immerse yourself, then you will accelerate your language learning. And, um, I mean, how old the average age of, of your so we, users? Uh, again, depends on the market, but uh, I'd say in emerging markets, it's more between 18 and 25. And in more developed markets, it's that age group plus 40 plus. Okay. And those we could be what Richard is saying, out of need or professional lead perhaps that you need to develop. Um, how do you see technology I mean, as we go, and we're, we're running out of time, as we go into language learning, how do you see technology playing a role? I'm asking this because I'm looking at you know, uh, startups or well, scale-ups like Unbabel that want to translate uh, the internet uh, are, are making it more available content in your own language. So the incentive to actually learn continuous learning a, a new language through technology, how do you see that playing? Well, firstly, I, I don't think the need to learn a language is uh, going to go away. Even though we might have AI and can do real life translation, there's absolutely no way that in a few years, even if technically it's impossible, I would be sitting here talking, talking in German and you would be listening it in, in English in your, in your e bot. I mean, I, I don't think this is, this is going to happen because language learning is so much more than translating your own words in another language. It's about connecting with other people, learning about other cultures, understanding other worlds, and has a lot of brain benefits uh, as well. Um, so I think technology uh, enables us to learn much more about how to learn a language. We now understand much more about vocabulary retention. We have started to use artificial intelligence to actually have an intelligent vocabulary trainer where we can surface the right woke up at the right time. So language learning for, for thousands of years had been this kind of black box where no one really knew exactly how to learn a language. Now, finally, with a lot of those online players who gather a lot of data, and we work with uh, universities as well in terms of research, we now can shine a light in this black box and really understand what is the most effective way to learn language. I mean, my, my take depends a lot in the, in the time frame you're talking about, right? Uh, I mean, ultimately, I think it's doomed. Like, language learning is doomed, right? Because either we're going to have technology that actually translates everything real time, Language learning is doomed. Yeah, as a subject, as a business as well, right? Okay. It's like, that's my take. It depends on the time frame you're talking about, right? Okay. Um, either technology is going to solve that, or, I mean, we are learning more and more, like, everybody, like, uh, is concentrated in the number of languages we are speaking, right? Like, 5,000 years ago, there were more languages than today, and so on. So to me, again, it's like thinking about like, what, why do you want to learn a language, and again, it's not so much about learning the language itself, it's about like communication and communicating with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so while, for example, in our case, we are helping kids learn English, our goal is not to really learn English, our goal is to create equal opportunities for children. And so we're using English as a medium to teach other things, things that we think are gonna be true no matter what time frame you're thinking about like empathy, like critical thinking, and this type of skills, yeah. the 21st century skills people is talking about. So foster empathy, foster curiosity, and, and the flexibility, uh, cognitively speaking, to continuous learning, right? We're running out of time, as I said. So uh, uh, one last thought for the audience. If you want to learn second, third, fourth, whatever language you want to learn, what would be the first thing you would do, All right? I mean, move to another country? I move to another country, yeah. Okay. Go, I mean, I, yeah, that's the best way. I learned English in Sweden, by the way. <laughs> you cannot say download Buzu. I get a lot of people here. Get a boyfriend in that, in that uh, okay, language. So love. <laughs> love. Yeah, love. Immersive moving and to another country. And, and could, it, could it happen in a shorter period of time? Or would you actually need to make a life there? Could you go there for six? What, what do you, you envision that? Like a summer internship could work? Depending on age. 
on age. Depending, depending on, on age. age. Depends yeah. on the language. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. months old, uh, maybe it's just like a month, right? <laughs> I think exposure, <laughs> when you're very, very young, it, it sticks. It stays, it sticks. It's very, very potent. Mm. But even a summer, as a, a high school student, spending a summer in another country does amazing things to, to the brain. Because it's still, we're neurally plastic all our lives. It's a matter of degree. Okay. And the ways, the situations in which we uh, live. The social context, as the, the chairman of Telefonica said, that the future is about the social context of learning. And I think that we're understanding much more how brains are driven to learn. There's a limitless desire to learn at all ages. None of us want to stand still. Yeah. And for our children, uh, the parents of Madrid were so excited about getting their babies in the experiment. In fact, parents were refusing to join the control group. So we had to flip. We had to flip the experiment mid-year, so experimentals were experimental for the first year, got the intervention, first half of the year, and then flipped. So there is a drive amongst all of us, and particularly parents for their children. It is the wave of the future. It's right. what we should allow people to do by uh, taking everything we know about the brain and learning and making it available to people of all ages, but yeah. particularly the children. Thank you, Beth. Richard? Learning, learning, bueno. Going abroad is a very, very good solution, but it's not within the reach of the majority of the people. So we have to find, I've met many people who have solved the English problem living here in Spain without going abroad. But it, the learning experience, be it languages or anything, it, it, the brain performs the learning. But if you can capture the heart, the brain, you'll change the trajectory of the learning curve dramatically. So if you, get, if you can get the student's heart, you've got, it, you've got all the rest. And technology does not, does not achieve that yet. We have to inject into technology the human, the, the social, and the emotional questions so that it captures the person, and the person falls in love with the area of knowledge that they want to learn. Right. And that's technology still has a ways to go in that. Right. Guys, uh, we're, we're out of time. Uh, Richard, Chris, Bernard, Pat, thank you so much for being here. I invite the audience to go out there and